Jeremy Fink and the Meaning of Life, Chapter 8. The Old Man. Mom, Lizzie, and I are sitting on the steps of our building waiting for Mr. Oswald's driver to pick us up. I didn't get any notes from Lizzie last night, and I didn't write any either. I'm afraid she's mad at me. At least she's back in her ponytail and shorts again. No skirt and long hair blowing around. You've both got the notebooks that that policeman gave you, Mom asks. We shake our heads. I got the impression you're supposed to bring them, she replies. Go on up and get them. I'll wait in case he comes. As Lizzie and I climb the stairs, she asks if I'm mad at her. Relieved, I shake my head. I thought maybe you were mad at me. After all, you wouldn't be in this mess if it weren't for me in the box. And you wouldn't be in this mess if it weren't for me, she counters. Do you think that we'll still be able to find the keys in time? I ask. We'll keep our eyes open, she says firmly. We won't let this stupid community service thing ruin our plans. We're about to shake on it when the new kid comes out of the apartment. Don't let us interrupt you, Rick says, gesturing to our inimminent handshake. We both pull our hands away quickly. How's it going? Lizzie asks in a high-pitched voice that's almost a squeak. She says it to both of them, but looks at Samantha. Good, Samantha says. We're almost all moved in. Cool, Lizzie says. Then she blurts out, I like your earrings. Samantha puts her hands up to her ears. I'm not wearing any earrings. Rick laughs. That kid is not getting any nicer, and I'm just about done feeling sorry for him for having to move to a new place. Lizzie turns beet red. I mean, the ones you were wearing yesterday. Oh, thanks, Samantha says. They were a gift from my grandmother. Cool, Lizzie says and nods. If you want to come over sometime, I can tell you about the neighborhood, that sort of thing. Sure, Samantha says. Whenever. Cool, Lizzie says. I want to alert her to many of the other words at her disposal besides cool, but I think she would punch me. Can we go now? Rick asks, pulling his sister down the hall. Bye, guys, Samantha calls out. Bye, Lizzie says, waving a little. Since when are you so friendly? I ask her. What do you mean? She says innocently. You know what I mean. I'm just trying to be nice, she says, putting the key in her door. You know, neighborly, like you said. I'm allowed to make new friends, you know. Who said you weren't? I reply, hurrying into an apartment before she can respond. I grab my notebook and head back outside, not bothering to wait for Lizzie. She sits down next to me on the stoop a minute later. She has taken out her ponytail. I don't know why it should bother me, but it does. I pull up my book and bury my nose in it. This must be him, Mom says, standing up and shading her eyes. I look up to see Lizzie staring, her mouth hanging open. Coming down the street towards us is no less than a limo. It pulls right up in front of the building. A limousine is in front of our building, like the kind movie stars take. The driver steps out and tips his hat at us. He is wearing a real chauffeur's uniform. I didn't think people like that existed in real life. Jeremy Fink and Elizabeth Molden? We nod vigorously. Usually Lizzie is quick to correct anyone who dares use her full name, but I can tell she's too excited to bother. I'm James. I have come to take you to Mr. Oswald, he says. And you are Miss Fink, I gather? Mom says yes and asks to see some paperwork from the community service people. Exchanging wide-eyed glances, Lizzie and I scramble up the steps and wait by the car until Mom gives us the all clear. You two behave, she says, stepping back onto the curb. I'm surprised she's not more shocked by the limo. Mr. Oswald must have told her that's how we'd be traveling. Did she somehow forget to tell me? Do you have your sandwiches? She asks. Yes, Mom, I say reddening as Jane looks on. When he steps aside, James opens the back door for us. Lizzie scrambles inside and I follow her onto the cool interior. I can't believe we're actually going to be driven around in the city in a limo. The seats are cream colored and I've never sat on anything so soft in my life. Even though it's a bright sunny day, the inside of the limo is dim because the windows are tinted. A small refrigerator is built into the wall along with a television set and a radio. Another long seat faces us and I immediately put up my feet. Lizzie can't reach that far. We pull away from the building and I wave at mom as we go, but she probably can't see us through the windows. Lizzie swings open the door of the fridge. Look! Strawberries! Juice! Soda in glass bottles! Can you believe this? I shake my head, leaning back against the cool seat like I'm used to the life of a luxury. Man, oh man, Lizzie says. If I had known doing community service was going to be like this, I'd have gotten us in serious trouble years ago. <clears throat> at the first red light, the window dividing us from James slowly lowers. He turns his head to look at us. I imagine everything is satisfactory, he asks. 
a small smile on his face. Lizzie unscrews the top of a Coke bottle and asks, Is Mr. Oswald really, really, really super rich? James laughs. He's pretty well off. I didn't realize pawnbrokers made so much money, I say. James turns back to the road and shakes his head. Oh, that's just a sideline. Used to be his family's business. Mr. Oswald's main job is selling antiques. He has a knack for finding antiques, restoring them and selling them for much more than he bought them. Where does he find them? I ask, interested. All over, James says. Flea markets, antique fairs, auction houses, sometimes even on the street. People don't know what they have, and they just throw it out. Lizzie turns to me, and I know what she's going to say before she says it. Sounds like he and your dad would have hit it off. I nod, but my dad never fixed up anything to sell, only to use. Maybe he would have, she says. I watch as the window divider slowly goes back up. Maybe, I say, closing my eyes. When dad first died, I used to keep a list of all things that happened to me that he wouldn't get to see. Like when I hit a home run in gym class. Only happened once, but it did happen. Or when I won an award for a short story in sixth grade about a boy who burned an ant with a magnifying glass. In that night, his house burned down, and he knew it was all his fault, but the list was all about me. I had never considered what my dad would or wouldn't have done with my, his own life if he had gotten the chance. Maybe he would have sold some of the stuff he found and made a fortune, or expanded Fink's comics into a whole chain. I might even have a brother or sister by now. I bet he had dreams I never knew about. Is that what's in the box? Dreams of a life he never got to live? The car stops, and I open my eyes to see Lizzie happily munching on a strawberry. Want one? She says, holding out the box. I shake my head. Real fruit only makes me think of fruit-flavored candy like Starburst or Mentos, and the fact that I don't currently have any. James opens the door, and we emerge onto the bright sidewalk. I had expected him to be taking us to the pawn shop in less than desirable part of town. Instead, we're in front of a three-story brownstone on Riverside Drive on the Upper West Side. Before I can voice my surprise, the front door opens and a tall man appears, wearing a brown striped suit with a matching hat. He is puffing on a pipe. For some reason, his clothes don't seem to match the rest of him. With his round, ruddy face, shouldn't he be wearing overalls and a straw hat? You must be the little truants, he says sternly. His twinkling eyes tell me he's not really being mean. Never one to take an insult lightly, Lizzie says. I think to be a truant, you have to be skipping school, and school's out for the summer. <clears throat> How right are you, young lady, he says, cocking his pipe at her. I shall have to be more careful with my vocabulary. All right, then, she says. Come. He steps aside so we can enter. Let us get to know each other. James ushers us up the stairs and into the house. A small entryway leads to a huge room crowded with large boxes and packing crates. It looks like most of the place is already packed up. A few paintings still hang on the walls, but all the furniture is gone. The wood panel ceiling is so high that the whole brownstone must be this one floor, not three separate floors like I had assumed. A huge fireplace on the back wall actually has a fire going in it, even though it's almost July. An old man's bones need warmth, Mr. Oswald says. Following my gaze, that's why I'm moving to Florida. Let's go into my office and I'll tell you what you'll be doing. A round woman in an apron appears from the other end of the room and, her hands, and hands her his pipe. She stands in the mail return. Mr. Oswald says fondly, This house would stop running if it weren't for my housekeeper, Mary. Mary smiles at us, and I notice a Hershey's bar sticking out of one of the pockets in her apron. I smile back. She is clearly a kind in spirit. Lizzie is too busy peering inside a large open crate to pay any attention. Mr. Oswald leads us carefully through the maze of boxes and into a room about half the size of his fist. This, is, this one has another fireplace, but it doesn't have any fire. A big oak desk sits in the middle with this big leather chair in front of it. Shelves line two walls of the room with objects of every size and color. I see sports equipment like baseballs and bats and footballs and hockey sticks, but also lamps, clocks, paintings, sculptures, rows of books, a telescope, radio, jewelry boxes, piles of stamps and plastic folders, trays of old coins, basically anything and everything under the sun. I imagine this would be my parents' vision of heaven. I have to make a concreted effort to close my jaw. I realize I haven't spoken a word since we arrived, so I clear my throat. <clears> throat> um, Mr. Oswald? Yes, Mr. Fink, he says, sitting down beside the desk. I don't know how to respond to that. I only heard my dad and uncle called Mr. Fink. I don't know why it should surprise me that when I grow up, people will be calling me by the same name as my father, but it does. 
Uh, Jeremy is good, I say. Jeremy it is, then, Mr. Oswald says. Um, would it be all right if I look at your stamp collection? It'll only take a minute. Be my guest, he says, waving me over to the shelf. Are you a long-time philetist? I'm sorry, what? I ask, he smiles. A stamp collector. They are called philetists. Oh, I say, feeling a bit stupid. No, my father was. There's this one stamp he was always looking for, so now I, well, you know. He finishes my sentence for me. Now you have taken on his quest? I nod. Wonderful. When you're done, you can both take a seat, and then we can chat. The stamp is blue with the word Hawaii at the top, so it would be easy to spot. I quickly scan through the pages of stamps, but of course, it's not there. I put the pile back on the shelf and have to pull on Lizzie's sleeve twice before she tears herself away from an oversized doll with huge blue eyes. I don't know which is scarier, the doll itself, which has a vacant stare and I might come alive and attack you vibe, or the fact that Lizzie has ent was entranced by a doll in the first place. We sit down in the large chairs in front of the desk. As tall for my age as I am, I feel very small in the chair. So Mr. Oswald begins, I bet you'd like to know what you'll be doing here. Who cares what we'll be doing, Lizzie says. This place rocks! Mr. Oswald laughs. It's a deep and hearty laugh. <laughs> Thank you, I think. I'm glad you like my home. I'll sorry to be leaving it, but I assure you I do intend to have you work. My throat always tightens up when I look for my dad's stamp. I swallow hard and say, Officer Polanski said you needed us to, um, pack things up? These things, I guess? I gesture around the room at all the stuff. Close, but not quite, Mr. Oswald replies, touching the tips of his fingers together. I need you to make deliveries for me. Nowhere too far. All here in Manhattan. James will accompany you. I open my mouth to go to what kind of deliveries when Lizzie says, Woohoo! We get to ride in the limo again! Mr. Oswald smiles at her like one cute child who has just recited the alphabet, recited the alphabet for the first time. Then he stands up and says, I'm late for a meeting now, but I'm going to get you started on your first delivery. We can talk more tomorrow. I quickly get to my feet. We won't see you anymore today? He shakes his head. Don't worry. James knows what to do. But aren't you supposed to sign our notebooks at the end of the day? He walks around the desks and lays his hand on my shoulder. Don't worry so much. Just record your observations tonight and we can go over them tomorrow. All right? I nod. You'll have to forgive Jeremy, Lizzie says, popping a starburst in her mouth. He always reminds the teachers if they forget to give out homework. Where did she get the starburst? And why didn't she offer me any? And I only reminded the teacher once before I came to my senses. In between two, she adds, he even reads books during the summer. It wouldn't kill you to pick up a book sometime, Lizzie, I say through gritted teeth, not wanting to argue in front of Mr. Oswald. Mr. Oswald picks up a briefcase and straightens his tie. What are you reading currently, Jeremy? He glances over at my bulging backpack. Lizzie rolls her eyes, but I open it and root around. I hand to my latest book, Time Travel in the Movies. Are you a fan of old-time films? He asks, opening the book to the table of contents. I nod. I've seen them all, I say, hoping I don't sound like I'm bragging. What's your favorite? He asks. I have to think for a minute. It depends on how realistic they are. Like, if they could really happen, you know, scientifically. He doesn't answer, so I keep rambling. I mean, like, there's this one where all these guys... They, all they do is lie down on his bed, and then he concentrates really, really hard, and eventually he winds up in the past. Now that can't really happen. I would suspect not, he agrees, and hands me back the book. I pull Dad's box out for a second while I stick the book back in my bag. What an interesting box, Mr. Oswald says. May I see it? For a second, I'm torn. I've decided to not show anyone else, but I can't be rude, so I hand it to him. I look at Lizzie, whose mouth, who mouths the words, I shrug. I couldn't leave it home alone. Mr. Oswald hands it back to me and says, Lovely. I can give you some bubble wrap if you want to wrap this up. It will help protect it. Okay, sure. I say, surprised and slightly insulted that he hadn't said more about it or about the words on it. I guess he sees so much stuff on that wooden box it doesn't impress him. Help yourself on the way out, he says. All the packaging supplies are in the next room. But now, let me give you your assignment. He turns to his left and slowly strolls along one of the walls of shelves. I can't imagine what he's going to pull off. He walks past the oversized doll, past an old metal typewriter, and then runs his fingers along the spines of the books. He pulls out one of them, opens the front cover, then sticks it back on the shelf and pulls out another. He keeps doing this until he opens a small book with a light blue cover and an envelope slips out onto the floor. 
I'll get it, I say, bending over to pick it up. The envelope is yellow and thin, and there's a name written on the front in, the back, in black ink. Mabel Parsons. Mr. Oswald takes it from my hand and sticks it back in the book. The cover is so faded that I can't see the title. Even a reader like you probably won't be very interested in the topic of this book, he says, placing it gently into a cardboard box, lying open on his desk. It's about woodland animals. Woodland animals, I repeat. He nods as he tapes up the box with a thick packing tape. Owls, bears, rabbits, that sort of thing. It doesn't sound pretty boring. Are you donating it to a library, I ask? Oh, no, he says, but doesn't explain further. He puts a yellow post-it note off a pad and sticks it on top of the box. He writes an address neatly on it, and I can see his hand shake a bit with effort. I wonder how old he is. He's definitely older than any of my grandparents. He presses an intercom on his desk, and I hear a low buzz a few rooms away. James appears a minute later, and Mr. Oswald hands him the package. The address is on here, he says. I'd like you to accompany the children to the door, but then they're on their own. Yes, sir, James says. I'm about to follow the men out of the room when I turn to find Lizzie holding the blue-eyed doll in her arms. When she sees me looking, she quickly sits it back on the shelf. I raise my brows and she glares in return. We wind our way back to the front door, stopping once so I can pick up a sheet of bubble wrap. Good luck, Mr. Oswald says warmly, swinging the door shut behind us. Wait, Lizzie says from the top stair. Why do we need luck? What are we actually doing? Don't worry, we'll talk tomorrow. With that, the thick door shuts. We turn to James. Don't look at me, he says. I just work here.